quality, hearty band for this weather. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce to you today Richard Reeves, who really is a legend in our midst. I have to tell you, this guy has done everything that any of us has ever dreamed of doing. <laughs> he, uh, Lots of it legal. <laughs> He's now a senior lecturer here at Annenberg, for which we are extremely grateful. He has been writing a column which has appeared in more than 100 newspapers for the past 30 years, I believe. And it now appears on Yahoo each Friday, with this great step into the new media world. Richard was educated as a mechanical engineer, but it is in journalism that he has really done everything. Everything from founding a newspaper in Phillipsburg, New Jersey, to being chief political correspondent of the New York Times, to national editor and columnist for Esquire. I asked my husband this morning, where would you say you first thought about Richard, you know, new? And he said, Esquire. So many people did. New York Magazine. And um, get this, for six years he wrote a column uh, from Europe for travel and leisure. Mm -hmm. and Patrick. Also, uh, he's worked <laughs> extensively on television and film. He was chief correspondent on Frontline. He's made six television films and won all of television's major documentary awards. He was in the movie Day as the song, of course. And uh, he received this set as Joe the Radio Reporter. Right. <laughs> I've been doing my research. Well, pretty deep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really deep. I like the stuff I came up with. And throughout all of this, the truly amazing thing, I believe, is that somehow Richard manages to be both smart and sophisticated and witty and also big-hearted, which is not what everybody in high, that playing this high in the game is able to do. So um, Richard's first book, I believe, was back in 75. Right. And he's here to tell us about the newest one, and we're very grateful to have him with us in Edinburgh in general and with us today. Richard. Thanks. Well, the people, this is, this is like a clack. Nobody has to, uh, to clap. I, I want to, uh, obviously, I, I had spent uh, 25 years writing uh, my three books on presidents, on Kennedy, Nixon, and Reagan. And I knew at the end of that, that I, uh, if I never talked about a president or heard about them, uh, it would be too soon. So I wanted, there were two things I wanted to do. One, I wanted to write a book uh, that had a story. It was, uh, it had a narrative thread and adventure. Uh, and that involved a lot of people. And as I was playing and arguing with my editor about all of that, I decided on this book, uh, uh, writing about the Berlin Airlift, basically because of Abu Ghraib. I, I couldn't bear being, I, I, I've lived all over the world, I, I couldn't bear the fact that people were hating Americans, uh, that we were seen uh, as people invading countries uh, for the heck of it, as torturers. Uh, that was not the America I grew up in. That's not the country uh, that when I was a, a little boy, uh, I thought Americans were. And then I tried to look for a story which would tell the story of who I thought we were. And uh, in Tony Judd's book, Post War, and in David McCullough's book on Truman, uh, they, uh, they both give the Berlin Airlift only a couple of paragraphs. And in fact, even in talking to many of my own peers, they thought it happened in the 1960s and that Kennedy uh, was president. Uh, and talking to my students, they didn't even know there was a Berlin. No, but, but now they do. But now they do. And uh, I will, uh, uh, I want to read you three quotes at the beginning of the book. Uh, on March 19th, Stalin met, there are very few Russian records on this, but luckily this one, uh, the minutes of this meeting survived. On March 19th, 1948, meeting with the East German communist leaders, uh, Stalin, who wanted the Allies out of Berlin, he didn't want an outpost 110 miles inside East Germany, not only because he didn't want the espionage he thought would come with that, and a lot did, uh, he didn't want, 
he was he was less worried about a window to the east than he was about a window in the east to the west. He did not want uh, 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 people in the communist countries, in the Iron Curtain countries, to see how the other side lived. Uh, so at that meeting, he ended up by saying, OK, we'll make a joint effort. Maybe we can kick them out. Uh, the idea was that since all supplies had to come through East Germany to get to Berlin, there were a million soldiers of the Red Army there uh, around surrounding Berlin. We had 6,000 people, uh, 6,000 military people. And the reason they kept their people was the Red Army was never paid during World War II. Uh, so that the plan was in the Eastern European countries, uh, they would use the old, they would be pay them in the old, uh, in this case Hitler's Reichsmarks, which were practically worthless, but they amounted up to the pay of the uh, Soviet army. Uh, on June 29, 1948, when the Berlin blockade uh, was put into effect, uh, Harry Truman met with his cabinet, with the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, and with the new National Security Council, they unanimously said, uh, we have to get out of Berlin. Uh, it's simply a question of how do you feed a city of two and a half million people uh, when you've got nothing? We had, at that time, 37 cargo planes uh, in Europe, DC-3s, which could carry, C-47s, which could carry three tons apiece. At the end of that meeting, after listening to them, to General Marshall, to Robert Lovett, to, uh, uh, to Omar Bradley, and these people were legends. And Truman, who was Truman? Uh, Truman stood up and said, we stay in Berlin, period. Lovett tried to stop him. He said, Mr. President, have you thought about this? All the Russians need to overrun Berlin is shoes. And uh, Truman looked at him and walked out of the room. Uh, now, when, when, once the airlift started, this is a quote from, uh, the British played a large part, uh, from a Royal Air Force flight lieutenant named John Curtis, who later became Air Marshal Sir John Curtis. It was great fun. We were all together again doing an important job. You'd be talking to some fellow and find out he'd been a lawyer in Manhattan two weeks ago. And it was like that. This book is, the reason the book is called Daring Young Men is because it is of the way uh, those men and some women uh, were called up uh, uh, into, and told to report to a military base in 48 hours. These were people who had fought the war, because they were mainly pilots, air crews, statisticians, weathermen, uh, and now were home to new lives, uh, new wives, uh, college maybe, new babies, or babies they had never seen. Uh, and they were told to report back in 48 hours and go to Berlin for temporary duty, uh, which turned out to be more than a year. But that's the story I tried to tell. And if we can clip, I want to, it's too bad there aren't more students here, because this is an example of how news was once transmitted compared to what we do. But uh, this is a short clip showing news wheel, newsreels of the time, of what it looked like uh, in Berlin and in Europe, and uh, many of us are old enough to know that Europe was indeed starving, that it wasn't a joke when our mothers told us, uh, eat, your, uh, eat dinner to poor starving people of, uh, of Europe. They were indeed doing that, and when we come back, much of that was deliberate to try to keep Europe hungry. Out of Berlin. We are not going to be forced out of Berlin. 
In your opinion, is there any danger of war, General? I would not like to minimize the seriousness of the situation in Germany. In such a situation, there is always a danger. I consider it a small danger because the peoples involved do not really want war. The people of Berlin headed for the Place de la République again last week to protest communist terror tactics directed against this city's freedom. Over a quarter of a million of them streamed in from all four sectors to make this the greatest of Berlin's freedom rallies. Here, by the ruins of the Reichstag, symbol of German democracy, they assembled to put their case before the world. You people of the world, you people in America, in England, in France, in Italy, look at this city and see that you may not abandon this city, that you cannot abandon this city. With 500,000 people at this rally. But the West does not withdraw. Instead, the Berlin airlift is launched by a combined Allied task force. The Air Force designed more than 300 airplanes and more than 20,000 men to the airlift. And Britain made a large contribution of both aircraft and personnel. So that's uh, uh, kind of what uh, it looked like. Since we're a, a communication school, a journalism school, I want to point out one of the scenes in there, the Achtung Achtung uh, scene, in which the radio, uh, the, a radio reporter is announcing the news. The Russians got to, uh, the Soviet army uh, got to Berlin two months before we did. 
then they took everything of value out of the city, including every bolt, the power plants, well, the reason they were flying so much coal was to get an hour a day of, of electricity uh, in the city and also to keep some industry alive so that people had uh, something to do rather than just die. And the uh, included in what the Russians had uh, was Radio Berlin, which was the strongest uh, radio station in, uh, in Europe. All we had in the American sector, in the uh, allied sectors, which combined, was something called RIOS, Radio in the American Center, which was an 800 watt uh, operation that depended on phone lines for delivery. Uh, part of the, the genius of the airlift uh, was that we immediately mobilized jeeps with loudspeakers to go from square to square in the city. Because like any war, the airlift uh, was often a matter of, uh, of contradicting information. Uh, the uh, the, German, the uh, East Germans, the Russians, who could reach every house in Germany constantly would broadcast that the Allies are leaving. Uh, and if you do anything for them, we'll be here and we remember, and we've got your names, and they would list lists of names. By the time Rios got going, they were reading lists of names of people who were uh, believed to be Soviet or East German spies or agents saying where they were, what their home address was. So it was information uh, was a major uh, weapon in the uh, thing. If Germany was a, a country of starving people, the, uh, and that wasn't all by accident. Uh, France wanted badly, and the United States originally uh, considered trying to return Germany to a pastoral country, trying to move it back 200 or 250 years in history and restrain the diet per capita to 1,500 calories uh, a day, so the Germans would never have the energy to reindustrialize or to uh, uh, or to start a war. That was the so-called Morgenthau plan. It was devised by Henry Morgenthau, who was the United States Secretary of the Treasury, father of the uh, just retired uh, district attorney in uh, Manhattan. Among the interesting things, and among the things that attracted me to doing this project was that among the orders to keep the food to the Germans as low as possible, uh, this is just before the airlift, uh, American soldiers were ordered to pour gasoline on all of the garbage from our mess halls and, uh, and whatnot, and those orders were almost universally uh, refused by, in this case, very young men, teenagers, 18 and 19 year old privates and corporals who had not fought the war and all they saw was a city of old women, uh, crippled men and children. And so that many American soldiers, one of the characters in the book, a corporal named Spadafora from Pennsylvania, would load up tray after tray of uh, in the mess halls, which ran around the clock, everything ran around the clock. A plane landed and took off from Berlin every 40, from one of three airports. Uh, at all three airports, a plane took off or landed every 45 seconds. At that time, the spacing between planes at America's largest airport, LaGuardia, was 20 minutes. Anything less than 20 minutes was considered unsafe, and these people were doing it every 45 uh, seconds in planes that one Brit uh, described as a loose bunch of parts flying in close formation. Uh, because these planes had been on deserts in Arizona drying away while the Russians kept their troops in America it would bring the boys home immediately and we demobilized faster than any major army uh, of modern times but Spadafor and other people like him organized food lifts to take those trays or those garbage pails in which the trays were uh, to orphanages and to schools uh, around Berlin and they, uh, they weren't stopped. Uh, on, uh, on June 24th, uh, the, the Allies adopted a currency reform. 
German currency, as I said, was worthless, and they, uh, uh, they could not have an economy. Clay, who had some faults and many strengths, uh, felt that the United States would best be served, the world would best be served, by a prosperous, industrialized uh, Germany uh, as a buffer between what was becoming the obvious difference between East and West. Uh, to do that, they needed a real currency. We secretly printed, we had made a huge mistake at the end of the war, which was we gave uh, the Soviets uh, plates of German currency so they could print as much as they want, wanted anywhere they wanted. The second time around, now in 1948, the, 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 the new Deutschmarks uh, were printed in, uh, in, at Fort Knox and then were delivered in secret uh, to Germany. And were, it was announced on June 24th that uh, the old currency had to be turned in for new. Each German was given $40 worth of, of Deutschmarks. Uh, Stalin and some of his people realized that would, could be the beginning of the end. And thus the uh, blockade was begun on June 24th. Uh, on uh, June 25th, uh, Truman met in Washington and had the, uh, uh, the meeting that I talked about where everyone unanimously said no and he said yes. On June 26, 1948, phones rang uh, all over the United States. And if there weren't phones, which there weren't in many parts of the country then, uh, police would knock on the door in the middle of the night. And this is the way uh, uh, one of the people uh, described that. His name is Edwin Gear. Uh, he had been a lieutenant flying B-24s over the Pacific during the war. He had just graduated from Alfred uh, University in upstate New York, as had his new wife. And they were headed for New Mexico, where he was going to go to law school and she was going to teach. Gear later became a professor of political science, University of Connecticut. Uh, phone rang just before dawn. Lieutenant Gear said a sweet voiced Western Union operator. Nobody had called him that since he'd returned home after flying B-24s, bombing the Japanese in the Pacific. You have a telegram from the Air Force. I'll read it and send it right on to you. Ready? By direction of the President of the United States, you are ordered to active duty for the Berlin Airlift reporting to Camp Kilmer in New Jersey within 48 hours. Uh, so much for the plans to go to New Mexico and for his wife who had already gotten a job in Albuquerque. He and hundreds and hundreds uh, of other people were called to Berlin. One of those people was Dorothy Town, uh, who is sitting here, who was working as a civilian at Westover Airfield in, uh, in Massachusetts and who had briefly worked for General William Tunner. General William Tunner, who had run the hump in World War II uh, from Burma, India, to, uh, to China, uh, was finally called in. The, air, the airlift was total chaos uh, in the beginning. And uh, Tunner was finally brought in. There were a lot. There's a lot of, Dorothy and I were talking before this, uh, her name uh, then was Jorsky before she was married and she married one of Tunner's uh, assistants. There was a, a lot of politics and a lot of love and marriage in the uh, Air Force, in, a total, uh, in the airlift, in a totally unenforceable uh, law, the United, United States men were uh, uh, were prohibited from fraternizing with uh, Germans at all. There were a lot of 20-year-old and 19-year-old German women, and somehow uh, they found a way, although Dorothy, who was called from West uh married uh, one of Tunner's assistants before she went back. But how were you informed that uh, the, the governor of the United States wanted you to leave uh, Massachusetts and head for Berlin. Well, I had been um, told that I would probably be called. And um, so I received a wire, and then I received orders to report to a combined air lift headquarters, task force headquarters, at least by Germany. Um, 
and uh, had to go through a process of getting um, shots, immunization shots, which took a, a little while. Um, and then, I, I, as I say, I received orders. So I departed uh, Westover Air Force Base. Um, those were the days of propeller airplanes, not jets. And uh, got to Wiesbaden, got to Frankfurt, Germany. Prob probably um, um, went to sleep in my hotel after this very long journey. Missed the bus to Wiesbaden, but I was uh, sent, uh, was in touch by telephone, and I was sent a car, <coughs> drove over to Wiesbaden, driven over to Wiesbaden. And um, I um, was specifically asked uh, for going over because I had done work with General Tanner and he understood that I understood what his agenda was and that was to get airlift capacity in the Air Force because we've been thinking in terms for years of just service supply and he uh, was trying to convince an awfully lot of people in the Congress that we can't think like that anymore. We have to think in terms of time and airlift is the solution to that. So uh, that probably had, did have a lot to do with why he asked for me, because I'd been doing some editorial work for him. And um, I was given the responsibility of writing the, about the operational part of the airlift. I joined two others and a secretary in the office at headquarters, where every month we compiled a report of each month's activities and sent them to the Air University at Maxwell Air Force Base in uh, Alabama. So that's where the original information went, and all uh, original uh, reports of the airlift exist, I presume, in addition to Scott Air Force Base, Illinois, where uh, eventually there was an airlift command established, thanks to General Tunner's genius. And I have to mention, if I may, that it was General Wiedemeyer who spoke with Je uh, President Truman and really convinced President Truman that this man, Bill Tunner, could do this airlift. And uh, I think that was probably one of the reasons that Truman said yes instead of no. Well, a lot of, as, as you know better than I, there's a lot of politics between generals uh, in those days. and. Uh, William Tunner was our expert uh, in that field, and he was not called Willie the Whip for nothing. Uh, he was a very tough guy who knew, who only cared about airplanes uh, in the air. But to keep them in the air, these planes were flying five and six times uh, their normal amount. The planes were falling apart, the pilots were falling apart, and Tunner and his men organized the airlift in a hotel in Wiesbaden, to tell you how military politics works. Curtis LeMay was the uh, uh, commander of the Air Force in Europe after the war. He lived in the 102-room Heinkel Mansion in Potsdam, uh, the uh, German Champagne family. He assigned Bill Tunner to a room on the fifth floor of a hotel partly demolished, called the Black Goat, the Schwarzer Bach. And to get to his room, Tunner had to go through the bathroom uh, with open sides into the air. Uh, but both of them, in the end, turned out to, to be essential to that. Uh, I want to uh, tell you about a couple. What I wanted to find out the people, uh, to find the people who actually uh, did all this. I mean, there were giant men of history, including Ernst Reuter, the mayor of Berlin, who was a, an extraordinary man, uh, General Clay, who was, uh, and uh, on the Russian side, too, people like uh, Alexander Sokolovsky, who later became the uh, defense chief of, of the Soviet Union, uh, were doing it. But I want to I, I wanna tell you a couple of uh, stories. I, I can't tell you what a good time I had doing it. I mean, I can't believe uh, why everybody doesn't want to be a reporter. I mean, I mean, 
you walk in, people open their lives to you, you know, you never have to get... And so that one of the adventures for me in doing this book was uh, in Germany, going around and finding and interviewing old commies and older Nazis. Uh, and you see the, the way the world has changed. The former chief historian of... Uh, uh, Mrs. Town was a historian for the Air Force. Uh, the chief historian of uh, East Germany, deputy to Walter Ulbrook, uh, was a man named Norbert Potovan. And I found him living on the old Stalin Alley, uh, now Mark's Alley again. Uh, and he, uh, I, after we had talked for a couple of hours and he had told me that he thought tearing down the wall was a mistake, the whole thing, things could have been worked out. And then I said, what about your children? He said, well, I have only one child. And uh, I said, does he, it was a he. I said, does, does he agree with you? And he says, agree with me. No, he's a millionaire. He's a vice president of Deutsche Telekom. He has three Mercedes, and he thinks we were wrong. I don't know where... <laughs> Iowa in Bremen, I tracked down a man named, uh, who was 90 years old, named Ulrich Stampa, who had been a significant figure in Germany uh, before the war. He was an airplane designer, uh, worked for Focke Wolf, and later snuck out of the country, <coughs> captured twice by us, uh, and uh, became the air minister under Perón uh, of Argentina. Now he was back in Germany. He also was one of the world's great wind experts, uh, wind power experts. But I knew that, you know, I could get this guy to tell me what he really believed. He, like many other Germans, was a mechanic on the airlift. Uh, the mechanics were really one of, uh, one of the bravest things that Bill Tunner ever did and kept secret from the American people for a while was we did not have enough mechanics. So we were using, look, we found Luftwaffe mechanics. Clay gave him permission to do that uh, and he did. And people like Ulrich Stampe worked for a, uh, either a dollar a day or one hot meal a day, uh, and did a hell of a job. Uh, they were uh, supervised by these 18 and 19 year old kids. <laughs> a guy named Corky Colgrove, who lived, uh, lives in your uh, town, Colorado Springs, was a 19 year old American. He was put in charge of a crew of uh, 50, a 15 man crew of German mechanics, which included one former U-boat commander and two former Luftwaffe uh, squadron commanders. And he didn't much know what, he was in awe of these people, they were obviously older than he was. So the first thing he did was to try to teach them some English. And this is the English he taught them and had them lined up when the commanding officer uh, arrived, uh, a new commanding officer arrived to look at him. Uh, the English he taught them was Good morning, Major, you son of a bitch. Uh, so that they were, uh, there were men of history involved, but there were also uh, people. I want to read from a, a German boy who lived in, uh, in Fosberg. Fosberg was a city in the British zone, which we built into an airport. Uh, and this is what uh, he, his name is Wolfgang Gang Samuel, wrote. In 1948, I was a young refugee living in a rotting former Wehrmacht barracks. He wrote this in a paper to the paper, I think, Victorville, California. Uh, barracks located off the end of the runway at Fosberg. Cold, hunger, and fear of tomorrow were our steady companions. There were times when we thought we wouldn't survive until spring. The presence of the Americans on the streets of Fosberg brought a sense of security to us that transcended all other aspects of our miraculous survival. It was so different from the soldiers I'd known. Those had been men with guns whose faces were hard. The airlift soldiers were not like that. They carried no guns and they looked more like people to whom life had been good and who didn't mind sharing their own good fortune. And there came a day, his father had been killed his father was a German soldier, had been killed in the war. There came a day that an American appeared at the door and said to him, and uh, with his mother, and said, my name is Leo Ferguson. He said, call me Leo. Leo was from Colorado Springs uh, as well, 
uh, after uh, all the preliminaries, they moved there, and Wolfgang Samuel, who's quite a writer in his own right, by the way, on aviation uh, matters, retired, uh, just retired as a colonel in the United States Air Force. Uh, another boy, exactly uh, my age, uh, who couldn't stop, people could not stop talking about their airlift service. They didn't want to talk about the people they killed, and they had been killing people and people trying to kill them. Uh, another German uh, in the book uh, could recite every bit of what was in a care package he received from the United States, those 10 and 18 pound packets of tinned food uh, and whatnot. Uh, and you would often hear that this boy's name happened to be Helmut Kohl, and he was telling the story after he had become uh, the first chancellor of the United uh, Germany. Uh, the, the way the Americans were perceived uh, was told best to me by a man named Arlie Nixon, who was the chief pilot of American Airlines and had been a captain in the Air Force during the war. He got a phone call. His pay went from five fifty a month to one hundred and forty a month, and he was a captain again uh, in the Air Force. We also, to keep the thing going, stripped commercial planes at home, as did the British. Uh, and uh, uh, Arlie Nixon's plane, the city of Denver, uh, was uh, was stripped. The first day he got to Frankfurt, uh, he went to a cafe outside uh, the airbase. And as he opened the door, uh, every German, every German in the cafe stood, left their food, and walked out. Mm -hmm. Two weeks later, two weeks into the airlift, he went back to the same cafe and walked in the door. And every German stood again and went to the bar and got a stein of beer, their staple, uh, and lined them up across his table in rows, more than he could drink. Uh, in a year. Uh, the, uh, Noah Thompson was a farm boy from New Hampshire who had flown 21 missions over, uh, over Berlin. We, Berlin had been reduced to rubble. Uh, uh, had, uh, was op beginning a farm. He had just bought his family, had lent him some money in New Hampshire when he got the call and 72 hours later he was flying over East Germany uh, over the spot where his best friend, a man named Don Dennis, uh, had uh, parachuted to during the war and been beaten to death uh, by the people on the ground. That's what happens when bomber pilots or bomber crews parachute. People obviously hate them. It is exactly the same thing that happened to John McCain in Hanoi. Uh, John McCain came down in what is really Hanoi's Central Park in the water, and people rushed in to try to drown him, and he was saved by uh, by North Vietnamese soldiers uh, and police. Uh, I should leave a time to... Uh, part of the book is about uh, men of history, about Reuter, about Truman, about Thomas Dewey. This happened uh, during the 1948 uh, election. There is no doubt in my mind that the airlift is what won Truman uh, the 1948 election. Polls in the United States showed public approval above 88 percent, even if it started a third world, if it started a third world war, because it was the way I saw myself as a kid. It was the way Americans saw themselves. This is what uh, Americans did. Uh, the uh, uh, Among, I'll, I'll just mention one scene of of the men of, of history uh, was the Republicans were attacking the airlift uh, because they said it couldn't work and almost any everybody else thought that too and of course they said it cost too much we shouldn't be spending this much money uh, feeding the Germans us compared to the British the British had stricter rationing on their own food until 1950 than the rations they were carrying to the Germans uh, you learn, I learned, uh, I'm something of an Anglophobe uh, had learned that the British uh, vices are also their virtues. That steadfastness, that stubbornness, that refusal to give up 
uh, that is somehow uh, built into them. And the airlift, though General Clay and others have since denied it, the airlift was actually a British idea. And the same General Wedemeyer that Dorothy talked about was meeting with Ernst Bevan, the British foreign minister, uh, when uh, Bevan told him they had done calculations and they thought the two countries combined could bring in 4,500 tons a day, which would be an, of fuel, of food, of medicine, which would be enough to keep uh, German going. On General Tunner's de best day, we brought in, in the end, 13,000 tons. Uh, but uh, uh, Wedemeyer was talking about the difficulties of the airlift. This is before uh, he had talked to Truman. And Bevan said, I never thought I'd sit here and see an American, journal, uh, American general say he couldn't do what the, Brit what the RAF is going to do. Uh, so that they actually, uh, we supplied, we had the money and we had the planes in the end, uh, mo most of that. But they, a third of the work was done by uh, the British. Uh, and I'll, I, I just want to finish up talking about the impact that this had. Obviously, the thing talked, uh, NATO, which I think many of us think is probably what prevented a Third World War. If there had been a Third World War, it would have begun uh, in Germany. And it's highly unlikely that NATO would have been organized the way it was as a mutual defense treaty if Stalin had not made the mistake uh, of the blockade. But that didn't make it any easier, and that's not what revolutionized uh, aviation and other businesses. The systems that uh, Mrs. Town talked about uh, became EDI, Electronic Data uh, Interchange. <coughs> they were done with teletypes and telephones in those days, but it was the same principle. That is, every time a ton of coal was delivered to Berlin, another ton of coal began its move from the Ruhr Valley uh, to Fossberg. Today, if you buy a basketball down the street, by computers, uh, in China, another basketball is made and all along the line. Not only did that come from the airlift, as did radar ground control, uh, but the same men who did it for the airlift also did it for companies like Kmart and Walmart, which were based on the, on the Berlin airlift uh, model. The, uh, the aviation of it, if you're uh, interested, and I'll, uh, uh, I'm going to end uh, with that was almost unbelievable. Tempelhof Airport, which was the only airport really open when the airlift began, is a huge grass bowl. It's actually quite beautiful. Uh, the, and it also, uh, the terminal, the original terminal built by Hitler and Albert Speer, uh, was three quarters of a mile long. It was the largest uh, building in the world and it was seven levels below ground including hospitals, aircraft factories, uh, and whatnot. To get to at the other end of that field, still today, uh, there are seven-story apartment buildings. Uh, and they could not be torn down uh, because there was no housing. People were living in caves. The city smelled to death uh, because they couldn't get to the, the bodies even after three years. Uh, they came in over the, they had to come in over those apartment buildings, often with no visibility. I was laughing about people in the weather here. This would be good weather in Berlin, believe me. Uh, and the, uh, uh, they had come in over those apartment buildings. Now at that time, the clearance was 17 feet over the apartment buildings. Pilots always swore there were tread marks on the roof. Uh, whether there were or not, at that time, the, the lowest uh, standard uh, landing uh, protocol for the United States Air Force was 40 to 1. That is, for every foot you came down, you go 40 feet forward. To get into Tempelhof, they had to change it to 10 to 1, so that they dive bombed into that uh, airport and then flattened out and tried to stop us. And what it was was something called Marston mats, which are steel punched mats, uh, which were, uh, when the planes came down, they would dig into the mud, break the things, and German women, the rubble women, would come running out after each plane uh, and pour rocks or stone or do whatever. And then as the next plane popped out of the clouds, and the clouds were about 20 feet high, it went, popped out of the clouds, they would run off and sometimes dive into the mud to prevent it. 
They also, 17,000 women, uh, built with their hands, since the Russians have taken all the construction equipment out, uh, the third airport, in, a third airport in Berlin, it was a British airport as well, uh, in the French zone uh, called Tegel, which is now the main airport in uh, Berlin. But they, there are 17,000 women wearing bathing suits, high heels, evening gowns, because everybody had only one set of clothes. It was like 80. And the, uh, I built that in 60 days, built a full airport in 60 days, using the rubble of the city as the base uh, for, the, uh, for the airlines. So uh, in the end, uh, the, uh, the daring young men uh, delivered 2.5 million tons of supplies to Berlin and moved a great deal out too because uh, there was such a, a, such a thing as uh, made and blockaded Berlin, which was, we tried to keep Berlin industries running. There were 277,000 uh, flights. Clement Attlee, who uh, came uh, toward, for his first visit, the new Prime Minister of England, uh, uh, called it the, came and saw it and called the eighth wonder of the world uh, that it could even be done, and, and so it was. And when it was done and when it was over, uh, the daring young men uh, came home to America and tried to remember where they parked their cars, <laughs> or if they could remember that, where they had left the keys. It was like Woodstock and that. So at any rate, uh, it was uh, just a pleasure to do, but I, I mean, I did feel that this is the America I grew up in, this is the America I want to be Thank yeah, you. part of. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We do have yeah. time for a couple of questions or comments. Carola? I uh, just, uh, as a post-war German, I want to thank Mrs. Howe for the work that you did and for telling the story. Bye. Um, sorry. <laughs> I would not be here if it hadn't been for the Berlin era. Oh. But I'm, I'm so grateful for you, to you for telling that story. Thank right. You. Well, it was my pleasure. I met an awful lot of people uh, like you the, uh, who had who felt their lives had been, been saved by many of them who came to America, many of them stayed in Germany. How is the, uh, the airlift uh, portrayed in German history? I'm glad, kids, I'm glad you asked that question. I'm glad you asked that question. Uh, it's a two-week unit in history classes in uh, German gymnasium, and uh, it, there are also, that you just can't imagine uh, how, when veterans of the airlift go to Germany, how they're treated, uh, including the fact that there's such a thing as the German Gratitude Foundation, uh, which uh, has financially supported uh, the families now it still exists, uh, who lost uh, people or, or whose people were wounded or burned usually uh, in plane crashes in the airlift. They still uh, have a, a government office to make sure that no, nobody involved with the airlift uh, in America suffers. So it's a gigantic event uh, and, and piece of history in Berlin. And I was just stunned how it wasn't here. And they, of course, don't believe Germans think, uh, like everybody else, think, well, they, they must be doing the same thing in America, but we're not. And when I mentioned, I should have mentioned a thing. When uh, Lucius Clay left Germany after that speech up here, I left uh, the Rat House, the, the City Hall, uh, and went to Tempelhof Airport to, to leave for the last time to fly back home to the United States with his wife. 750,000 people lined the streets in total silence as he went by. The, the blockade was uh, one of the events in German, uh, in German history, uh, U.S. Soviet history. Uh, Berlin was the city where we almost went to nuclear war over in 61 and probably other years. Right. Can you just talk a little bit about the importance of Berlin as a political and military symbol and pressure point in the <coughs> Cold War? 
Yeah, I mean, the, the history of Berlin is so uh, tied up in so many ways. In the first place, for people who don't know Germany or some of the younger people, Berlin is in the far east of Germany. That's why there was 110 miles of East German territory between the Allied zones and the zone. Because of its political symbolism and importance, uh, both the Soviets and the Americans and the British uh, wanted to be part of the occupation and administration of Berlin, even though it was inside uh, Soviet territory. They never thought it would lead to what it, it did. Uh, and there were actually no written agreements. That's why they could blockade the land legally. Uh, in some ways, the Soviets are very legalistic people, uh, the, or at least their leadership. Uh, it, uh, but the, those three air corridors, uh, that flew in the city were because of international safety, airline safety rules. They were 20 mile ca uh, corridors uh, designed for uh, commercial aviation. That was on paper. And though the Russians occasionally fired on planes or fired any aircraft or put up barrage balloons and whatnot, they were not to go about, uh, to go to war about this. Also, their feeling, the Soviet feeling, Soviet history says that Berlin is a Slavic city and that it was founded uh, originally by Slavic people like the Ile Saint Louis was uh, in, uh, in Paris. And uh, so that they felt they had a right uh, to, to Berlin. And uh, so that also did it. Now, General Clay in the beginning, though he's later fudged that, uh, wanted to send an armor column of 6,000 men down the Audubon. There are 63 bridges on the Audubon. I don't know how that would have worked military. All, all the Ru Russians had to do was knock out those bridges. Uh, General LeMay, who, uh, quite a different uh, character, uh, wanted to bomb every uh, Soviet airfield in Europe. And the Soviets had a habit of putting their planes out in line <coughs> like this, so it wouldn't have been a hard thing to do, as he pointed out to Truman and others who told them that they did not intend to, uh, uh, to do that. Uh, but the, uh, uh, so that, yes, Berlin was the tinder point of the world. One of the, one of the great things, uh, effects of the air, of course, was that Germans became people again. It was the suffering Germans that people saw uh, in Israel's, and it uh, unified. We also, it was denied at the time, but it was obvious when I did research in the Library of Congress uh, that we did bring nuclear weapons during the airlift. They were in England, we didn't bring them, but they were in England for a reason, and we did the best we could to persuade Soviet intelligence that they were there, even as it was being denied at home that the uh, B-29 is called Silver Plate, which was a code name for uh, uh, nuclear capable uh, aircraft, of which it was the only one uh, at the time. So that uh, that also was a possibility because I'm sure we all know that there was no way we could have held Europe if the Soviets decided to try to take it uh, by land unless we used nuclear weapons. A large part of why the Berlin Wall went up was Kennedy, who was president by then, uh, Khrushchev had an enormous problem in Germany. That was 2,000 people a day were fleeing, and they were the best and the brightest. They were the doctors and the teachers and the engineers, and he had to put a stop to that flow. Kennedy's problem was that if Khrushchev decided to make, uh, to deal with the problem militarily, the United States would have no tro no no option other than to use nuclear weapons. We didn't have enough men, equipment, anything to stand up uh, to the Soviets. And John Kennedy, as anyone else, did not uh, want uh, to use atomic weapons. So that the Berlin Wall was really a joint project of of the Americans uh, and the Soviets, and it solved both problems at the same time. I don't know if any of you remember this, but. No one could find John Kennedy for three days after the wall went up because he did not want to comment on it because there's no doubt in my mind he knew in advance 
uh, he was going up and thought it was a good idea. But Berlin was always not Cuba, not any place else. It was always going to be Berlin if there was going to be a war. And this may have prevented it. Before we uh, have any other questions, I want everyone to know, since we are at one, and I know some people have to leave, that Richard will be signing the book, The Daring Young Men, out there, and can also continue to hold forth here if you want to, but you don't want to miss any potential book signing. So. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> um. Anybody else? Anyone last question? Before we... <coughs> Oh, Judy. No, yeah, no right. I had a question. I was going to say something. Oh, right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I want to say that the, yeah, the, you the, you the Jesus story. The Vegas, Vegas of the Rain or something, uh, which is also going to be speaking at Town Hall on Thursday night, and all students are uh, welcome as guests for free. So if you want to spread, that's downtown, and I can get the information. Are you sure it's Thursday? Thursday. <laughs> we'll talk later. I think I'm in San Francisco on Thursday. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Oh well, the uh, I'll deal with that later. Yes. June, July, August, September. The Russians gave us four months of good weather right. to set up the airlift. Why didn't they wait till October of 1948? Well, because they were dumb. Uh, they were dumb, and there was a reason they were dumb. Although their intelligence was superb, and ours was pretty good too. Uh, the, uh, no one would ever tell Stalin the truth. I mean, one of the most, you no, know, because they were afraid he didn't want to hear the truth. Okay. So that Stalin was told only what uh, he wanted to hear. The Russians at that time, the military, uh, thought it, this would be a pretty easy thing uh, to do. The Russians, on the other hand, figured all they had to do was wait for General Winter, who had defeated Napoleon who had defeated Hitler and would defeat the airlift. Uh, but it did not defeat the airlift. What defeated the blockade was the fact that communists don't know enough about capitalism, I guess. The, the biggest problem they ran into, which the military never anticipated, Stalin certainly never anticipated, was that the economies of the two Berlins and the two Germanys were totally interwoven. The only thing we kept running always during the airlift was the U-Bahn and the, and the S-Bahn because the electric power source, which was in the east, uh, if they turned it off in the west, would also turn it off in the west. And that they had no... Uh, Sokolovsky was a very impressive man in many ways. About a week into the airlift, when the Russians still thought it was a joke, had a meeting with East German industrialists. Uh, who explained for the first time that they they were going to have to shut down their factories because they couldn't get tungsten or they couldn't get this or they couldn't get uh, to distribution channels anymore. And Sokolovsky, who went crazy at that meeting, uh, said, why didn't you tell me this before we did this? What, what do you think is going to happen with... Uh, so, uh, I've forgotten where the question... Uh, began. Oh, it was General Winter. Yeah. Good if weather, he had started in October, uh, let's say, uh, it probably it probably would have been, I mean, it was, the airlift was a perfect storm. I mean, if anything had gone wrong, everything else would have fallen in on itself, uh, but it didn't, even though it was the foggiest, deepest foggy winter in European history and that these guys were flying on instruments the whole time. There was no VFR, visual flight rules, uh, during, the air, during the airlift. All right, thank you so much. Thanks, it was fun. And right outside are the books.